Thanks everyone for being here. I'm going to begin this uh, presentation. There should be a little bit of time at the end. It's um, going to be um, a lot of information, but I'll try and articulate it well. So, um, great. I grew up mostly in the forests of Northern California. And several times as a young person, I came across trees in the forest that had been hit by lightning. One had been struck from the top and exploded into giant splinters that formed concentric rings radiating out from what remained of the tree. Um, later when I decided to make art, my life in the forest and the stories that came from that life led me to research the history of how America had created many of its core mythologies through narratives that portray European colonizers as conquerors and tamers of an empty wilderness. I studied this history. It was important for me to learn about the historical, cultural, and religious narratives that intertwine to form a very particular kind of American mythology. A lot of my early work used the tree as a way to generate more complex compositions. I was interested in using the idea of the Axis Mundi or world tree as a point to begin an investigation of historical trauma that doesn't begin with the Puritans, but was certainly amplified by their racist and anti-environmental theology. The forest I grew up in for Puritans was a dark and wild place inhabited by evil spirits. I started compressing the histories, ideologies, and myths produced by the Puritans and other European colonizers into compositions that also referenced contemporary time. I was painting their ghosts distended in dematerialized voids. I was interested in fracturing and reorganizing horizontal space as a way to show that I wanted to upend a fixed and linear control and suppression narrative. I followed a chain of paternal destroyers, Washington, Boone, Ahab, and later Rockefeller, Carnegie, and Oppenheimer. I wanted to know why ideas like American exceptionalism and manifest destiny were not just accepted, but celebrated, and why I had such an adverse feeling to this celebration. The world I lived in and the history told to me that described it was precarious, confusing, and full of contradictions and lies. I wanted to know why the voracious extraction of natural resources and animals and violence toward native people and people around the world had come to define America as the greatest country in the world. Over the years, I had constructed a symbolic language that emerged from chronologically uncovering the development of these myths as they became more deeply ingrained within our national psyche. A national literature formed through the Puritans' projection of evil onto the New England wilderness, Indian Wars, slavery, the development of the hunter-trapper mountain man archetype, national political heroes forged in the image of this myth, religious fervor on the edges of the western frontiers, the writing of Moby Dick, more Indian Wars, the railroad, westward expansion, and manifest destiny, 60 million buffalo slaughtered, George Custer and the final Indian Wars, the closing of the frontier, Rockefeller and the rise of industrial capitalism and mass resource extraction, Gilded Age accumulation, labor revolts, banana wars, industrial agriculture, the world wars, Oppenheimer, Hiroshima, and the bomb, space blight. These expressions of conflict with nature stand out as mythically charged historical events that stimulated the construction of my lexicographical image system and its linear representation in the drawings. The project and studio practice became an historiographic investigation and simultaneously an autobiographical imagistic mapping of that research. 
After 10 years of making a chronological exploration of American trauma, I came to the story of the US construction and subsequent use of the atomic bomb. For this show at UC Berkeley's uh, museum, I researched the history of the university's historical and ongoing intellectual contribution to the construction of nuclear weapons. The show Skull Pile to the Sun at Jack Hanley Gallery in San Francisco and later the Wattis Institute in San Francisco was the culmination of this work on the atomic bomb and ultimately apocalypse. This show was part of an ongoing investigation into how we as humans perceive our place in the natural order. The sun is the energy source in this natural order. Nature is consciousness. We are struggling to become fully conscious. A fear of our own individual death is hard to accept. Is there time to become fully conscious? There are at least two apocalyptic scenarios now operating, global climate chaos and nuclear self-destruction. Confronting the double apocalypse is a transformative, transformative process. The work in this show was a manifestation of my personal confrontation with the apocalypse archetype as an individual psychological process that seeks transformation and as an objective examination of the ways in which we currently and historically have produced myths and ideologies influenced by our need to dominate nature as a mechanism for denying death. The work was an examination of the confluence of vengeance and creation that has become embedded in the American psyche and has contributed to our current confrontation with apocalyptic realities. Robert Oppenheimer was a central figure in the work. I was interested in the way he fit into the trajectory of my project as a paternal figure engaged in an intense effort to control nature, recreating the sun, but became more and more obsessed with him because of the ways his figure embodied a complex amalgamation of several American colonizer archetypes. Oppenheimer's efforts to create a mechanism that would simultaneously provide a way to merge with the natural forces of the cosmos and destroy the material manifestation of those forces on earth in the form of life was one of these compounded archetype narratives. I saw my confrontation with global and individual annihilation as necessary to expanding the project and simultaneously as a metaphor for disrupting previous methods of creativity. The intuitive process became more a part of the work. The transformative navigation of my personal apocalypse was manifesting as new kinds of mark making and images. We started engaging creativity as a cosmic process. It was an extended investigation of how the hunter mythology continues to seek out regeneration through violence and how this violence will ultimately have to be transcended if we are to continue living on the planet. The apocalypse archetype as manifested in the dominant narrative of the current American psyche is the result of a collective projection that has demanded violence and domination as the regenerative imperative for cultural renewal since our earliest Puritan beginnings. For this show, I also made a solar powered sculpture and video. Oppenheimer's image on the screen is controlled by the sun. Solar panels installed on the roof of the Wattis Institute control the potentiometer that dimmed and brightened the image. When the image disappeared completely, the black circle became off-white in a white void. I started thinking more about the sun as an autonomous force disentangled from American history. 
I met a man named Jim Marcy on the street in the Seacliff neighborhood of San Francisco. He was looking at the sun through a telescope. Later, I found out that he was a tax accountant. Through his telescope, he was observing and through drawings, keeping record of sun flares and sun spots. We got to know each other and I asked if I could redraw an entire year of his sun recordings as one drawing. He said, okay, and I made this drawing that is now in the collection of the Whitney Museum titled Jim Marcy's Sun Flare and Sunspot Drawings, 1992. For another piece, I asked friends and family to write a one sentence memory they had of the sun. I painted their responses and called it, We Remember the Sun. This is one of the uh, submissions that a great artist named Zyler Jane sent. As I said, I was invited to the show to, I was invited to show the work Skull Pile to the Sun at the Wattis Institute at CCA in San Francisco in a show called How to Build a Planet That Doesn't Fall Apart Two Days Later. The drawings and the solar powered Oppenheimer video that I had shown at Jack Hanley gave me the idea to solar power the entire school. The curator, Will Bradley, was supportive of this idea and I began the process of seeing if it was possible. It turned out that it was, and I made a petition that called upon the school's president to solar power the entire school and included it in the show. It was supported well by the CCA community. The idea proved to be also economically sound and was supported by the members of the CCA board, but unfortunately was ultimately turned down by the president's office. I continued exploring the theme of our personal, historical, and mythological relationship to the sun and this show at the Susan Ingett Gallery in New York City. These paintings combine narratives from American history, both included and excluded from the consensus narratives and with apocalyptic scenarios of the 21st century. Some of these apocalypses were imaginary or religious and mythological. And some were weather related. For the show, Sound from a Rock, another show at Jack Hanley Gallery in San Francisco, I started looking at the motif of the sun and other cultures and discovered a star pattern that most likely originates in ancient Persian tiling, but mysteriously appears in early 19th century Ohio quilts. The star of Bethlehem quilt emerged from an unknown origin around 1810. This work explored possible relationships between this star pattern's reference in Persian, Iranian, Zoroastrianism and early Christianity. At the time and still today, I was interested in ways that East and West have shared culture rather than been in conflict with each other. This installation is from the same show, but in a second and separate gallery. The cubes in the gallery function as a diagram of time and indicated potential relationships and decisions we can choose to engage about history and making history, as well as referencing the bounded platonic cube, the unbounded and infinite projections of the past and future in the image of a cone, the earth, 
extraction of natural resources, and man's manipulation and machining of raw materials. The photograph in this installation shows the hand of democratically elected Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh caressing the crack in the Liberty Bell during a visit to America one year before he was overthrown with assistance from the CIA. This image of Mossadegh performed the role of a semiotic bridge between the cubes and the gold square, as well as presenting a documentary fact within a vortex of metaphor. I was asked later to install a version of this show at the art space, a foundation in Liverpool. And ultimately the cubes were eventually acquired by Cheryl Haynes's Foresight Foundation in Nevada City, California. They're permanently installed at Foresight and aligned with the spring and fall equinoxes. This work, again at Susan Inglet Gallery in New York, was derived from a paragraph in the first chapter of Moby Dick. The sculpture in the show uses images of all the shell creatures in the Pacific Ocean. This silk screen is taken from Caravaggio's Narcissus. Mirroring and the story of Narcissus are central for Melville in this chapter. The paintings in this show are moving toward reduction of forms and abstraction as a way to make formal metaphors. There are various kinds of references to mirroring even mirroring previous work. And then very literally the book itself as an object. I also made work for the show that used mirroring in the form of video feedback. These images were made pointing a live feed video camera at a screen running John Huston's film version of Moby Dick. I also included these drawings made during a time I was crossing the Golden Gate Bridge on bicycle every day. From the bridge, I looked down and out at the Pacific Ocean. On the surface of the ocean, under my feet, I saw constantly shifting moray patterns. I started incorporating these patterns into my work for the show. After this Moby Dick work, I really started exploring abstraction and fragmenting and kind of breaking down and pulling apart all my previous work. For this show called Feeling Easy Feelings at the Inman Gallery in Houston, I started thinking about my practice in the studio in fundamental physical terms as a process of dialogues. I was thinking a lot about unfixing and trying to make work that felt like natural processes. And I wanted to fuse my physical and mental movements in the studio, use cutting a painting or collaging fragments from another painting with references to geological, historical, cultural, and psychological movements. I also included these sliced and reordered photographic pieces of dialectics happening in nature, like volcanoes and river gorges and earthquakes.
for a while, I really thought a lot about time and change and flux and transitions. I made another text piece that asked friends and family to respond to this question. I then, with a lot of help, transferred their answers to the wall of the gallery in varying weights of pencil. I kept probing ideas of deep time and change. I made this sculpture from limestone and marble. Limestone is made when tiny sea creatures die and sink to the ocean floor. Over time, the sedimentary process compresses this material and makes limestone. Some limestone, after time in certain places, goes through another process, metamorphism, which heats and pressurizes the limestone into marble. Then I drilled holes into the two rocks and joined them with a copper rod. When the rod is shaken or bowed, it resonates and makes a tone. This show titled Morning Air, again in Houston at the Inman Gallery. started making me think about the dialectical processes of nature and the universe as something different in the studio only in order of scale. I continued to look for new ways to make images by adding a step of dramatic change to the process. Sometimes I would slice a painting into uniform strips and then reorder. And paint on top of it. and weave it and obscure it i started trying to make paintings that were like moments of equilibrium pulled from a perpetual state of adaptation These paintings are provisional, imperfect, and in flux. No future or past state receives any special reverence. I wanted these paintings to represent a kind of flux that matched the unsentimental momentum of the natural world. History, as it's told, has high points and low points, golden ages and dark ages, purpose and lessons. Time by itself, though, isn't bounded by these categories. I scanned these images from Andrew Stewart's compendium of Greek sculpture then cropped the images, and then printed the results on marble slabs. Every stage of remediation is a deviation from the sculpture's original perfect state. So thousands of years of wars and neglect left them disfigured, and photography compressed them into a new medium. Then scanning abbreviated them further, and cropping detached them even more from their academic context. I wanted to show that these resulting prints were not adulterated or ruined versions of some ideal insulated from the flow of time. I wanted viewers to take pleasure from their newly abstracted forms or the veins of the marble slabs blending with the marble of the printed images. And like the paintings in the show, I was trying to be sensitive to what these objects were 
and what they might be, but not at the expense of what they are. In this same gallery with the marble pieces, I connected a video camera to a projector and pointed them both at the same gallery wall. The camera catches passersby in a feedback loop, an infinitely regressing projected image that deteriorates as it recedes. I wanted to put the viewer into the endless churn of production and reproduction. The digital decay together with other losses, accumulations, repetitions, and distortions mixed together with the sculptures on the table and the other and the other images in the exhibition mirrors the forces I see at work in both the environment and the built world. And ultimately, the transformations generated in the studio aren't qualitatively different than those caused by accidents, migrations, wars, or erosion. They're only distinctions of scale. There's an old portico in Golden Gate Park called the Portals of the Past. My interest in the site comes from a reference in Hitchcock's Vertigo and my experience of passing by it regularly for many years on bike rides. In Vertigo and San Francisco folklore, the portals of the past are associated with the supernatural and a disruption in our understanding of the physical world. They are a place where spirits, once of our world, now pass back and forth between here and the unknown. In the show called Doubled at Gallery 16 in San Francisco, I used the portals of the past as a catalyst to associate autobiographical, historical, and fictional narratives that might help me organize an impossible mapping of my position in time and space. I was asking to discuss the feeling of being out of time with time itself. The show was an acknowledgement of the inevitability of loss. I was looking at the loss of the past, the present, and the future. How this loss had manifested in my family's past. As well as the culture around me. Previously, I had been interested in change and transition, but now I was grappling with actual loss. The loss of partners, friends, the city I had known, a feeling of being in time, in the present, that seemed gone and impossible to recover. I look for ways to double what was and what there is now. and how to reconcile the sameness and the difference. I sought the help of animals to dislodge myself from a vertigo of time. I documented these dialogues and filled a book until the block of time unraveled and the present became present again. And then I spent an afternoon repotting plants. I took inspiration from discoveries I made about the formation of the Long Island Sound for this show at Halsey McKay in East Hampton. The gallery is situated one mile from a region of the Sound that 16,000 years ago was the site of a very large glacial meltwater waterfall. 
During the thawing of the last glacial maximum, the Long Island Sound filled with fresh glacial meltwater. This ancient and most likely never seen body of water is called Glacial Lake Connecticut. At the eastern end of Glacial Lake Connecticut, a massive waterfall developed at a low spot on the ice dam created by the Orient Point Fishers Island Moraine, now known as the Race. The waterfall was nearly a mile wide and 60 feet high. The waterfall slowly yield, yielded to erosion and eventually Glacial Lake Connecticut drained completely. The system of stream channels that developed as Glacial Lake Connecticut drained away and the sea levels increased became the avenue for salt water to enter the Long Island Sound Basin around 15,000 years ago. Ocean water entered the Long Island Sound Basin through the waterfall notch. It then spread westward along the channel system. By about 9,000 years ago, seawater had completely replaced the fresh watered glacial lakes and Long Island Sound was beginning to attain its present configuration. This piece on the back wall of the gallery is made up of 180 eight by 10 inch painted pages taken from a book called Waterfalls of the World. This is an excerpt from the catalog of, of the show. The magician scratched an image of the waterfall into a photograph he had taken of the large wooden doors that obscured his sculpture. One spring, they visited his mother who lived halfway up a volcano. They drove the summit road just after the snow was cleared. The melting water burst forth from every crevice. There was a rushing, bubbling, and trickling sound all around. Later, he asked if she would think about Long Island Sound with him. They began researching and discovered an ancient and monumental waterfall. They had also been thinking about magic. They agreed that although he really knew nothing about magic, he did have a feeling for it, a feeling that he had known quite a lot about it in the past, but after being knocked on the head by some powdery yellow stones, had forgotten all of it. She told him to think about the waterfall. She reminded him to focus on what was behind the waterfall. The origin of water on earth is not completely understood. It is likely that water was present during the formation of the planet and also created from the internal processes and rain producing volcanic eruptions over time. It is possible that comets and meteorites brought water to earth. They sat together and talked about Long Island Sound, the sound of Long Island. How did it get there? In this show from 2018 at Inman Gallery, I started thinking more about the volcano and its role in the creation of life and water on the surface we live on. I began assuming the volcano to be the Earth's original author. The 10 drawings included in More Love are a part of a larger project and film titled Walking the Strike of a Fissure in which two people travel along fault lines in Iceland, Greece, and California. Their pursuit of volcanoes charts a proposition about natural phenomena and authorship and centers the volcano with its earth shaping eruptions as a formative progenitor of human concepts like meaning and representation. The volcano and by extension the earth is a creative force. We are involved in these geologic processes but also distanced from them. In this work, I was pushing at the boundaries between these temporalities, the time of the human experience and the time of the shifting earth.
They both have their various speeds. In each, the momentum of change lends itself to narratives of emotional process, just at varying scales. This painting, called The History of Itself Being Made Part One, Score for Hephaestus's Foot, is the first work in a series of large-scale history paintings. The painting is the first in the sub-series about the history of the volcano and is specifically a meditation on Hephaestus, the Greek god of fire, volcanoes, blackness, artisan sculptures, and metallurgy. He is the child of Hera, whose bearing of Hephaestus is unique in that she achieves his birth without union. Hera rejects her son because of his deformed foot, throws him from Mount Olympus down to earth. Eventually, Hephaestus returns to his smithy on Mount Olympus and crafts the magical tools of the gods, Hermes's winged helmet and sandals, Achilles' armor, Aphrodite's girdle, and Helios's chariot are the work of Hephaestus. The scene does not retell a story of Hephaestus from the Iliad or the Odyssey. It assumes the volcano to be the Earth's original author. It situates the volcano's creation of the Earth's surface as an original radical primeval act of creative and narrative agency and presents a visual account of how the volcano's authorship has deposited, accumulated, stored, and distributed narrative throughout Earth history. Score for Hephaestus's foot transcribes a moment at the boundary between Hephaestus's metaphysical and physical worlds. It assumes the volcano to be the Earth's original author. painting is currently awaiting its possible placement on a single wall for the next 10 years. Curiously, the decision about whether to commit the painting to this position in space is dependent on the movement of the sun, which coincidentally parallels the story of Hephaestus' construction of Helios's golden chariot, built to carry the sun through the sky from east to west. So this is about the end. Um, I'm gonna show a little bit of new work. Some of it is finished, some of it is maybe finished. And just talk a little bit about that work and where that work is going. Um, and will be shown in Houston in September. I started with this quote from a Wendell Berry book called The Unforeseen Wilderness. Throughout their history here, most white men have moved across the North American continent following the fictive coordinates of their own self-affirming assumptions. They have followed maps, memories, dreams, plans, hopes, schemes, greeds. Seldom have they looked beyond the enclosure of preconception and desire to see where they were. And the few who have looked beyond have seldom seen, have seldom been changed by what they saw. Blind to where they were, it was inevitable that they should become the destroyers of what was there. Henry Berman was my great, great, great grandfather. He was one of these white men who made the journey west along Daniel Boone's Cumberland Road and settled in Eastern Kentucky sometime in the early 1800s. I've started thinking about what he saw if he looked beyond his enclosure of preconception and desire to see where he was and to let what he saw there change him. From the history I know about him, it appears he didn't see much differently than other white men. And so for this work, 
going up in September, I'm imagining the things I would hope he may have seen, but most likely did not. He may not have seen them because they were hard. He may not have seen them because they were hard to see, but also because he didn't think to look or ask about what was there and what had been there, other than the things he needed to know to become, as his obituary notes, one of the pioneering merchants of Newport, Kentucky. I wonder if he knew about the tens of thousands of caves running through the Cumberland Plateau of Eastern Kentucky, or the ancient woodland and Mississippian culture cave drawings they contained. I wonder if he knew the woodpecker at the cave mouth often indicates that more drawings are coming deeper in the caves and they will appear again at the exit point and that they lead the viewer into and out of the underworld. I wonder if he saw all the different ways the pileated woodpeckers of Kentucky make holes in trees. Across the river from Henry was the Great Serpent Mound, a snake effigy constructed by the Adena people, a pre-Columbian Native American culture more than 2,000 years ago. The mound is aligned astronomically with the solstice and equinoxes, as well as the moon cycle and possibly other astronomical bodies. It is located on the plateau of the Serpent Mound Disturbance, a 250 million year old meteorite impact crater. I wonder if Henry ever visited the Serpent Mound or if he ever felt the Kentucky Magnetic Anomaly, a mysterious and very magnetic source region within the Earth's crust beneath Kentucky and Tennessee. It seems possible that he would have noticed the vast stands of American chestnut trees that spread across Kentucky and Appalachia. Some estimate of up to 4 billion trees. And I wonder if he noticed the ghost forests that replaced the living trees when almost all of them started dying from a blight introduced from Europe. These paintings will try to visualize and dramatize the phantasmal traces of ancestors that followed Boone's Wilderness Road. Did they see where they were or what and who had already been there? Or could they only project their vision as desire for the resources of the new world in the wake of their ruinous extractive history in Europe? Are we bound to a cycle that extracts from nature until it is totally depleted and then seeks a regeneration through resource extraction and violence toward the peoples that steward those resources? What will it take to break through our enclosures, enclosures of preconception and desire to see where we are and recognize how to live there a long time without destroying it? Thank you, Sean, for that wonderful lecture. Um, really the breadth of the introduction that you gave us to your work. I know everybody's still a little bit stunned and I see a lot of um, our, our little Zoom hands clapping and, um, and appreciating this. And all right, well, people are still formulating their questions. Maybe I can start with one that I'm also kind of trying to think through. Um, the, this, last series of work in progress that you showed is just really, truly beautiful work. And I think we're, we're very lucky to see it here in, in this manner, but it also really reminds me of the first pieces that you showed um, and your, your original interest in forms and this question of kind of a settler colonialism that your work is circling back to. I wonder if you could share kind of 
the ways in which you've arrived back towards this similar question, I guess, 20 years later in your career? Yeah, I mean, it was probably, yeah. Uh, let's see, it's been like, yeah, 10 or 12 years since I like had it specifically like engaging with those questions in that same uh, kind of narrative way. Um, well, what happened was I, I, I kind of like literally sort of burned out uh, um, on the content and also the way of making that work. Um, I, there, I, it required a lot of uh, detail and like uh, attention and uh, time and uh, kind of a, a, a sort of particular kind of obsessive commitment. And, um, but when I got to the Oppenheimer work, uh, um, I started smelling smoke um, that I, you know, I thought was like coming from the neighbor's house or coming from the kitchen or something like that. And I know everyone was like, we don't smell any smoke. We don't know what you're talking about. And, um, and then uh, everything just started smelling like smoke, even like, uh, you know, things outside that were probably like flowers and fresh air <laughs> start smelling like smoke. And I was like, I gotta take it. I gotta like change this up a little bit. I have to, um, I gotta shift this practice. Like, uh, so without going on and on too much, it was a little bit too much to deal with um, at that point. Um, I, when I got to Oppenheimer and I thought about the kind of like the sort of uh, questions that are posed by that history, it was just, I guess, a little bit too much. So um, I just sort of like um, immersed myself in a process, um, almost like a physical, like the work just became, you could see it was like more, it became more physical, literally, like I did it on the floor. Uh, it, it wasn't, there was no question about, there was no, there was nothing precious about it. If anything, it was good. If, if, if it, if I did mess up, it was more like became a practice of making mistakes. Um, and I, I, I thought about it in like some conceptual ways and, and thought about it dialectically and like, you know, you can think about history dialectically and obviously natural forces are doing dialectics. And so I, I, I did get, um, I did still feel attached to those questions that I had originally had about history and um, the natural world, but I felt like I was more embodied as a maker in the, I was just like in that process is, is how I thought of it. So instead of sort of like uh, intellectually sort of dissecting it and laying it out and organizing it and all these like kind of um, hierarchical uh, um, lexicographical uh, structures, I, I just sort of like embodied um, the processes that I was, you know, had been looking at, um, whether it was history or natural, um, you know, the natural world um, as, as a way to be in the studio. Um, that, I don't think I answered your question, <laughs> but um, so anyway, after doing that for a little while, um, uh, I realized that I still had those questions, those bigger questions. Um, they were still they they were still important to you know um, to articulate like um, less abstractly. Um, I I don't know if if the work now is is not abstract, um, but it's 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 obviously not totally abstract it's it, there's narrative has returned but through the process of making that other kind of work more physically i think it 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 did something to the composition to the side things where that i used the page and, um and so it shifted a lot of it, sh it shifted a lot of things just formally it, it, it moved the work uh, along out of like it, there was sort of a conceptual and form so it's okay for me to like go back to it now because I figure like I've sort of like you know uh, broken things up enough to um, surprise myself again I guess
Thank you. Um, we have a raised hand here. Larissa, would you like to unmute? Yeah. Hey there. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Larissa. Yeah. Hey, Sean. Thanks. Um, that was great. I was just thinking about how, you know, your work is filled with such profound meaning and um, it was great to hear you talk about it and describe it and for us to be looking at it and, you know, particularly reflecting on your class and abstraction this last semester, thinking about, you know, the language that you developed and the marks that you make. Um, and I'm just curious to hear, like, if, if a viewer is taking in your work and you're not hearing from you about it, um, what would you hope they're taking away or if there are all these levels of meaning that you have in the work, like what's important for you to communicate through it? Um, well, it's, you know, it's, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm interested in people not being like, uh, feeling like they're locked out uh, and like not included or something. Um, but I, um, yeah, I don't need them to be read in the way that I, uh, by a viewer in the way that I talk about them, you know? Um, yeah. And from there, you know, it is what it is. Um, I think um, when, when, it, when, when a show feels like it works or where a body of work feels like it works, um, you know, I'm sometimes lucky enough to have people write about it. And uh, when I, you know, read some of that writing, I'm like, oh, that's cool. I, you know, I didn't <laughs> think about that at all, <laughs> you know, and uh, that I, and that's what I, that's what I like. So if anything, you know, I'm interested in like people looking at the work and then if they're interested in it and they want to talk about it, like hearing what they have to say about it and, um, not necessarily having that like, you know, match up with exactly what I, um, with, you know, my spiel, but maybe something totally different and like something that surprises me that I hadn't thought was possible. And oftentimes, and I talked about this actually in class today, is like sometimes that writing can actually help your work because you you read that and you're like, oh, maybe that's the, maybe that is what I'm doing, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Um, no, I, I, I'm, it's okay if, I mean, it's okay if people get it and then they like it and they have things to say that sort of like in line with like what I'm thinking, or if they have a totally different take on it, you know, that's, that can be great. If they don't like it, um, you know, that's also just part of, that's also part of it. Thanks. All right, let me read you a couple questions that came up in the chat. Um, so Lydia and Michelle were both were both wondering about the materials of your work. So Lydia Black writes, wondering about materials used in the work. Can you tell us some about that? And Ella Wilson writes, does the material of painting or printmaking ever inform the execution of the work? Um, well, I'll just start with that. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I have. I do make prints. I really, I like, I like making prints. Um, I like, um, I like, I like what happens to ink when it gets like pressed into paper. Um, I don't, I can't tell you why. It, it might have something to do with like, um, there's the trace, the human quality of like what happens when the, the marks are, are pressed into or you know um uh into into paper um I, I i haven't quite figured that out what i'm so drawn why i have been for my life so drawn to that um but um so i do a similar thing when i when i make the work i mean i'm i'm using a, a pen nib you know a lot and and so i'm 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 kind of inscribing you know the paper um, so I use a, a, a paper that's made by Twin Rocker, um, a, a great paper, handmade paper company in Indiana, and um, they make a like a very heavyweight um, drawing paper. Um, uh, it's I don't know, it's you know it's, it's like four hundred pounds or something like that, and um, I I get it you know 
uh, they run it back through the machine for me. So there's a really like plated surface. So I like the ink to sit up on top. And I mean, I could geek out on this for a long time, so but I won't. But um, um, so the um, yeah, so I use ink. I use acrylic ink and I use um, gouache and uh, that's it pretty much. I, I, I used, I used to use oil paint, but I used it too much in a con enclosed space and I can't, I can't do it anymore. I, my glands don't, <laughs> don't, they don't deal with it. Um, and as far as the printmaking question goes, like, yes, some of my work, I do um, go back and forth between like um, a drawing, scanning, printing that out, tracing it, putting it back on uh, a, a larger piece of paper or another drawing or something like that. So I'm kind of constantly going back and forth between, um, um, you know, the digital and the, and the analog um, process using printing at the same, at the same time, you know, like at home was just like a, a home printer, but um, I have worked with Gallery 16 on several projects where we're, um, drawing on top of prints and things like that and um, probably going to do that again soon with a new print project that i'm, I'm going to be starting pretty soon yeah thank you uh looks like matthew taylor you have your hand raised i'm going to see if you can unmute yourself yeah hey sean uh Hi, matthew. Just some work um I have, I don't know, there's a question in here somewhere uh, related to the last couple of topics. Um, like the relationship between you and your work and the view and the work and how that all fits together. And your work is like anything but didactic, right? So I, I understand where that question is coming from because it's the work's really open-ended uh, and doesn't really give itself away, right? And I, I think there's something in there about like the way that the work functions for you. And it's probably related to what, how you were talking about, you know, the transformation of printmaking and these different processes, right? And when I hear you talk about it, it sounds much more like an investigation or that, that the work itself is like how you ask questions or how you, you know, uh, come to know what you think you know, right? So that I'm wondering if it's, the work is not didactic because you're not answering a question or you're not starting from like a position of knowing but you're starting from a, a more open place right and seeing where the work takes you and where it suggests um so that like yeah. the way that the the thinking and the making relate and the functionality of like what the work actually does right um is there do you have can you talk about that or yeah i mean it's, i think that's that sounds like stuff i i think i think about um <laughs> yeah the thinking through things you know right uh, that you don't yeah. you know i think about it for our students right and that yeah. not having to know where you're starting from but having a starting point and seeing where you end up through the transformations right and how that can lead to ideas and understandings that you didn't know in the beginning yeah yeah um, like do, I, we, do we, we yeah we talked about that yeah we, yeah go ahead do you see the work just functioning in that open-ended kind of way for you where it might end somewhere different than where it begins and it's not about like necessarily knowing or, or I, I think some of the the trick it I think a lot of times we we interpret art as you know the artist telling us what they're what they're feeling or what they're thinking and when the artist doesn't give that away as easily or clearly I think we can kind of struggle with what just the function of the artwork really is, right? What is it for the maker and how do we relate to it when it's, when they're not telling us like what to think or how to feel? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, uh, I'll just try to answer it like for my, cause, um, I, we, I mean, we had, to, I had this discussion like today with students, but, um, yeah, it's a good opportunity maybe to sort of like off, uh, offer my, you know, personal experience with working like that. Um, I think, you know, whatever happened, however I grew up with the people I grew up with and the place that I grew up, I just ended up with like this, uh, this kind of um, 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 dissatisfaction with this particular narrative. Um, and, um, and I, the more I, you know, looked into it, I realized it's like, you know, a big kind of problem 
um, and not just related necessarily to, you know, the like American history, mm. right? That it's like a, it's a human thing. Yeah. And it became like overwhelmingly huge, you know, the, the, the feeling of it. Um, and it just continues to sort of like unfold and like change direction, even in, in the research um, as it gets, you know, um, I'm reading a book right now um, by a great book that I should, that I should, I think like deserves a pitch. It's called Columbus and Other Cannibals by a man named Jack D. Forbes, who um, taught at UC Berkeley for a year and started the American Indian. Um, he, he, start, he was a founder of AIM, the American Indian Movement, and also um, American Studies programs around the country. And um, this book is like just, um, you know, a pretty radical um, analysis of um, the, the founding of um, the, um, the colonized um, uh, North American continent by Europeans who, in his opinion, brought with them a virus, um, a mind virus um, that he attributes to um, um, the, um, the complex um, agricultural um, city-states in the um, Fertile Crescent starting, you know, eight, nine, 10,000 years ago. And um, so um, the, the, the complexity of that narrative is not, you know, it's, it, there's history and you can, you can name the history, but it, it's also like spiritual. And it's also like something that I don't know if this culture understands totally anymore with this uh, has to do with the mythos. And the, so, you know, when we start talking about like the mythos and the, as compared to the logos, um, those are different <laughs> ways of understanding the world. Um, and um, I, I, I'm attracted to the mythos. I feel like it's a real space. I think um, I do this work in some way to like stay in contact with it. And that, that could be why um, I'm not, so concerned with uh, you know the the answer because in the mythos is only a is is a space that generates questions yeah that's, that's well you doing. mentioned you referred to your work as research and i i just i think that's like a key point to emphasize like how you approach it and how it functions for you right that research isn't the end of something it's the middle or the beginning of something new right yeah, sometimes it like connects things and sometimes it just makes things more complicated. And more, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And then, you and then of... I'm responding as, as, as to those, to that and in, in, in drawing. Yeah, through the yeah. making of the work itself, right? Yeah. Is, yeah, yeah, that process. yeah. Is the thinking, it's just really like the thinking through it. Yeah. That's why some of the drawings are very, are in some way like very simple and like almost like iconographic things. And you know, just you know, a two-topped tree. Yeah, um, I thought of it in some of them. There were some where there were some overlap, right? And I think you're talking about concealing, right? And just the act of concealing doesn't have to be uh, dramatic, right? You cover one thing over another, and mm -hmm. and that simple action can have you know deep and meaningful implications, uh, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. There's a point in which like. Um, yeah, um, the, um, um, I'm totally blanking. I know, but someone here can help me. Um, I know Leonie can help me with the title of Duchamp's work at, in Philadelphia with the doors and that you look through. I can't remember what the title of that piece is, but anyway, the whole piece is concealed, right? Mm. Um, that's how you enter that piece is, is like, yeah through its concealing, right? Or oh, like yeah. what's the, uh, I don't know, I'm terrible with names too, the box with the sound of its own making, uh, where it's recorded, who, who made that one? The recording of the making of the box is put into the box itself and you can hear it, but it, you like you can't see it. Uh, oh, I don't know. It's interesting, that sounds, yeah. That sounds good though. Yeah. Um, uh, Shannon, yeah. right 
étant donné is the, the work that you're looking for. Étant donné, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, étant donné. Yeah. <laughs> Same. So. Yeah. Um, well, All right, I'll you, stop Matthew. taking up everybody's time. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, thanks, thanks Matthew. Yeah. We just have a few more minutes. I wanted to um, read a few comments as well as it looks like we have one more question. So, <laughs> <laughs> Cynthia, can you, Am I still can you out? ask it? Because, yeah, because yes, all, I'm, all I'm hearing is like woodpeckers. Is there a connection? <laughs> <laughs> I noticed you started your talk with trees and the fascination of the trees exploded by lightning and your new work references alteration of trees by woodpeckers. Is there a connection between the new work and the old? Yeah, um, for sure. I mean, um, that earlier work is like, um, is always been there. I never, I know it looks like if you look at this show, there's like in the round in the middle, you're like, that shit's totally gone. Like that, there's nothing related anymore. But um, there, there, there was, but the, the, I just had some experiences early on and I, I mean, I can't, um, that, that I think um, in, in the place where I lived and um, they, I mean, I had some, you know, <laughs> had some sort of experiences that were formative in the, in the, in the woods. And um, uh, they, um, they keep, you know, they keep returning, whether they happen in new ways in real life or they, they, they sort of come up in the work again, but yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, I will I probably like have to like, you know, give a shout out to my, my mother at this point who pointed these things out to me, you know, in a lot of ways and not necessarily like the, um, the mythos stuff, but like that bird is special, you know, it's a pileated woodpecker. It's, this is what it's, this is like, you know, what it's about, you know, in a, in a natural history kind of way. Uh, so it was just, it's just sort of in me, you know, but, um, the, the trees right now are more about like the Kentucky, the, the, they're about Kentucky and about the, the pre 1492 Kentucky. Um, and then the Kentucky after that as well. But, um, the, the, uh, my, you know, my ancestors who came to, you know, North America came into Kentucky and, um, I was very into this Wendell Berry book, and um, and um, it's all about Red River Gorge in Kentucky, and um, beautifully written and de descriptions of of the forest and our relationship to them. And 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 that quote was like very striking to me. And and Carla, thank you for um, the the kind uh, um, words about that. And um, the, and those are just to be clear, those are you know. Those are my, the, I, I echo those, but those are when, that's Wendell Berry, that like, that, that demand that, that um, white men like pay attention uh, to where they are and what's, what's around them and, and how that has always been the problem. Thank you so much, Sean, for, for this lecture and for your time. And, you know, um, I encourage all of you to continue this conversation beyond tonight's lecture. We're so lucky to have Sean at San Jose State. And Sean will pass on the contents of the chat to you because there are just some really wonderful comments that we don't have time to read tonight. So That's thank great. you all for coming. Um, I hope that Many of you will join us again next week when we're hosting another Sean, Sean Leonardo, on a special night. It'll be a Thursday night, so not a Tuesday night lecture next week, but a Thursday night lecture. Um, so again, thank you, Sean, <laughs> virtual clap, and thank, thank you all you. for being here. And thank you, people from far and wide who attended this. I see like some beautiful, old, familiar faces. Nice to see you. <laughs>